this was my first trip to the Falklands and I had actually with my a group of friends had tried to plan that trip and we were scheduled to go to the year of the COVID shutdown. And we were obviously unsuccessful because no one was going. Uh, so then we had to get back in the queue once it looked like things were loosening up and so forth. So we got pushed out a couple of years and hence we went in December of 2023. So. Um, I'm just curious for the folks that are sitting here. Has anyone actually been to the Falklands before? Nice. All right, it's you and me. You can back me up. <laughs> What's your name? Yeah. Yeah. Catherine. All right, so Catherine's going to back me up when she sees these folks. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to orient everybody as to kind of what's going on. And this talk, by the way, it's the first talk for this program. I've given lots of programs. I've actually given programs here probably two or three times, David. I think in the past, I'm just, is, has anyone seen my other programs here? Oh, I got a whole new audience other than you, David. Wow. Um, so anyway, this this is going to be more than just looking at photos of penguins, although that was certainly the the whole idea of going to the Falklands was, was to see penguins. So I just want to orient everybody and give you a little background. So we're going to try to like rush through that to get to everything else. So here we are, right? So everyone that was on this trip, and there was four of us, my group, and then three in another group, a friend of mine helped put it together and we were meeting up with them. So everyone's getting out of Atlanta and we're coming all the way down to Santiago, uh, Chile. That's where we got to get to. And that's an eight and, a, eight and a half hour flight. And by the way, it's three days to get there and it's three days to get home. And the getting home three day portion is really long three days. <laughs> Uh, so you do a lot of this, <laughs> which is waiting at airports, and that's the 12-hour um, wait on the return trip at the Santiago airport before we left at 11.30 that night. So we basically found a bench out in front of the airport and sat down. But you make your way to Santiago, and you still have to get all the way down to uh, Punta Arenas uh, down here, spend a day in Punta Arenas, and then get over to the Falklands. And it's one flight a week getting in and out of the Falklands, so... Hence, you've got to build in that extra day because if you miss that flight, you missed your first week in the Falklands and you don't want to do that. So uh, that so we basically end up spending a day uh, there. But you get to Punta Arenas. Uh, it's kind of on this inlet. So there's a whole bunch of birds that you can actually get there in the small town of Punta Arenas. Did you go in and out of Punta Arenas by chance? Yeah. Uh, more towards the territory. Oh, Cruz. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, anyway, so lot, lots of, uh, and it's a really cool little town. Uh, a little bit more on that in a second. And then, uh, ultimately out of Punta Rios and over to the Falklands uh, here. So we got the East and West Falklands and uh, we'll look at the number of locations that we went to in a second. And so uh, as you arrive in the Falklands, you're actually flying into the military base. Uh, that's where you fly into and it's, it's British, right? So it's the Brits that control everything here. And so when you arrive in the military base, uh, you've got to clear customs, that's a whole thing. It is a tiny, tiny little airport. Uh, and I don't know how they kind of reconcile the whole idea that hundreds of people are coming in and out here on, on a Saturday and you're waiting in line and so forth, but it is what it is. Um, and so ultimately you end up over in Stanley, which is where you're going to fly out of to get to your destinations. And that's how you get to all the islands that you're going to. Uh, and by the way, there are, I had to look this up just to verify this again. There's only... It is less than 3,700 people that live in all the Falklands, most of which live either in Stanley or on the military base. 98.5% of the population is probably there. The handful of other areas and small islands that are, that are inhabited, in some cases, they're inhabited by only a few people. And we'll get to that in a minute. And you'll be shocked when I tell you a couple of stories. So anyway, we have to fly to our first location all the way up to Saunders Island. And then from Saunders Island, we make our way all the way across. We go down to Sea Lion, from Sea Lion over to Bleecker. And from Bleecker, uh, last location is up to Volunteer Point. And on your return trip, if you're coming into the Falklands, they want you back close to Stanley and kind of, you know, on the mainland, not on an island. And so we were driving then from uh, Volunteer Point not to Stanley, but to the military base, which is a little bit further away. And that took f four hours just to drive to get back to the military base. Again, another long day on the return trip. But I just want to orient you and just get everybody 
set as to, to kind of what's going on here. So when you fly into um, Chile, into the, the airport there, it's the international section on one side, the domestic on the other, it's all right there, which is what you're looking at. So there's no kind of going back and forth in terms of airports once you arrive there. And yes, you can get a Dunkin' Donuts when, <laughs> when, you're, when you're at the uh, airport there in Santiago, Chile. And the Holiday Inn is the only hotel. It's right there on the grounds and directly across the street is where the domestic uh, location of the airport is to fly out. So uh, very convenient as, as far as once you actually arrive uh, there. And again, lots of waiting when you're in these airports, unfortunately. Uh, the pro tip, by the way, is when, so we flew Delta from the States uh, out of Atlanta to Chile. If you're gonna do this, uh, make sure you get the, like it's a premium plus or something like that. It gives you like five and a half extra inches of leg room or four and a half, whatever it is. And I'm telling you, whatever the price was, and it wasn't a lot, it was worth every penny. So that's the pro tip. Uh, you arrive in Punta Rios, really cool little, a little city there. People are very friendly, you know, found a very inexpensive hotel, no frills whatsoever, very clean, beds, showers, that's all we need. Nice restaurants, all within walking distance, a couple of blocks. Like I said, right along the, uh, the shoreline here, we picked up uh, the inlet here, we picked up a bunch of life birds, including not there, but very close, Chilean flamingo. Uh, and they've got some nice signage there for some of the birds that you can see, which was kind of cool. So they're very kind of into the whole bird thing even there. Uh, we found just a little cafe to hang out in before we could check into our hotel. Uh, lots of, you know, good coffee and, and some sweets in the morning because, again, we had to wait to get in. And uh, the people were just very friendly. All the people we met there were friendly. All the restaurants we ate at were, were very nice. So then from there, you, that next day, you're flying out. Um, this is uh, just a look at a little bit of what Stanley looks like. Uh, again, there's not a lot of people that live in the Falklands. Most of them live here. And there's not even a lot of people that live there. Uh, Ultimately, you make your way from the military base to the Stanley Airport. Not much of an airport there either. Uh, it's pretty small. <laughs> and you're waiting for your domestic flights because that's how you're getting from location to location. And so now we are going to begin uh, the adventure. And again, I just wanted to kind of set everything up there. So you're all photographers? Uh, we were all photographers, yes. For them, it is, yes, December. And so this is breeding season for the birds, which is why we are there. Okay, so the first location we make our way to is Saunders Island, uh, which I had some, some background on a lot of this because my friend Mike Militia, who I do some teaching with uh, uh, for the Mass Audubon. In fact, I'm actually teaching a workshop, a couple workshops in November for Mass Audubon, and uh, Mike's teaching one with me. Mike has been to the Falklands twice, so he kind of helped set this up. We overlap with him and his wife and another friend at three locations. Some of these islands that we visited, well, Saunders in particular, it is a really big island. Like, I had no idea how big it was going to be. Somehow I thought it was going to be smaller. And, oops. So you're flying from location to location. You're in this, um, these small planes. I think that I was told they were built in, uh, in Poland. And they seat a total of six people, so the pilot, uh, plus you can fit uh, you know, five more folks in and, and your gear. And they weigh you and they weigh whatever you're taking. And you get your body weight, that's part of it, and then you're allotted, I think it's roughly 60 pounds. And anything over that, you pay a fee for that and then you just pay it in advance for all your flights once you arrive. It's, it's very efficient. And I must say everything ran very smoothly, very smoothly, I was quite impressed. And that's what, this is what the planes look like. Every plane that we were on basically looked like this. Um, the pilots were great. So you land in Saunders and your good buddy Dave picks you up and Dave's got a really thick British accent and he's a really cool guy and he can tell you everything about Saunders Island. And oh, by the way, five people live on the island. And, and, and it's Dave's, and, and this is the kind of community that's there, the housing where, where the people that live there and this is the gentleman that owns the island, him and his wife. And so Dave and his wife and then one other person, that's the five of them. And occasionally there's one or two other people. So there ain't a lot of people on Saunders Island. This guy is, a, is actually a very good naturalist and birder. And I'm just curious, is anybody familiar with the name Keith Bildstein from Hawk Mountain? If you are or not, uh, this gentleman here, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, 
he's actually knows Keith Bildstein and I am good friends with Keith Bildstein and he found that out. And so he came running out, who's the guy that knows Keith? And I had to introduce myself and otherwise he wasn't going to come and, and meet us. So anyway, uh, sheep, a lot of sheep on the island. That's primarily where they were making their money, had been making their money for, for many years, but now they're making a lot of, a lot of the money um, to support the whole ecotourism thing. And, and they all kind of get it down here in the Falklands, as you're going to see. So there's two locations on Saunders Island. The first of which is the Neck, which is here. And it has this beach, this large beach here. Cruise ships do come in, people uh, disembark. Did you go to this location? I'm just curious. Okay, that's fine. Yep, there's there's a, there's a, several on, on Falklands that, that will do this. And so the cruise ships pay a fee to the owner of the island so people can disembark and they get to spend like three or four hours there. Other than that, you basically have the entire place to yourself. Nobody else is going there. That's the accommodations. <laughs> it, it, of all the places we stayed, this was the most, everybody's got to watch me, rustic. <laughs> uh, so there's a bedroom here that has bunk beds that the four of us are in. And then my buddy, Mike, uh, this is his friend and his wife, Ann, is not in the ship. There's another bedroom here and a small bathroom. And that's it, right? Uh, the food was actually pretty good. It was all uh, frozen, but it's it's homemade, and they give it to you, put it in the refrigerator, heat it up, and the, and the food was actually pretty good. And by the way, we're not there for the food anyway, so like they could have just fed us, you know, Cheetos and you know, uh, uh, Gatorade, and you probably would have been fine. As you can see, all the boxes of of, of food here. So once you leave the, your 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 luxurious Hilton hotel. Uh, and you make your way onto the beach in the area. I mean, the, the penguins are, are right here, right? I mean, just like right out, they're there. Uh, it's my buddy, Scott, who I've known since kindergarten, by the way. Uh, and I have to say that when, when we had planned the trip and I had done all my research and I had talked to Mike and other people that have been there, you can only be so prepared for what it is you think you're going to see and experience and so on and so forth. And one of the things that Mike kept telling us was, you are not going to believe how windy it is. Now, I've been to Iceland a couple of times, spent a lot of time in Iceland on both trips. I know what wind is like in like, you know, remote locations. Yeah, Iceland was like, you know, being in the Bahamas compared to what, uh, what the Falklands could be on certain days in terms of the wind, not so much the, the temperature, but just the wind. It was, it was pretty crazy. But it's just, it's really this, this just absolutely amazing scene when you just kind of view it from afar. And as you make your way down onto the beach, these penguins are just kind of, they're just there doing their thing and they are completely uh, habituated. Uh, I don't think tame is quite the word, maybe it is, um, but they, they have absolutely no concern of you whatsoever. Now keep in mind, you know, more than a hundred years ago or more, you know, they were slaughtering penguins by the thousands, right? I mean, by the thousands. And in this location, there's actually the remnants of some of the areas where they would boil the birds down. That being said, again, these birds just like, it's almost like, uh, the only way I can describe is if, if there was a cow on the beach walking and you, and you were, they would have no distinction as far as I could tell between anything. They're just like, you're not a predator, whatever, you know, we don't care. But, um, the great thing about this particular location is there are, um, you're going to see king penguins, not a lot of them, but king penguins, gen twos, which most, mostly are here, Magellanics, and rockhopper. So you're going to get four species of penguins right here. And we knew we were going to get four, and we saw four at most locations. There's a fifth that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And so it's just unbelievable in terms, of, and we're going to look at more penguin photos. And I'm just going to show you a few more of the species to see there. So brown skua. Lots of skuas. This is a you know it's a big seabird. It's a predator, and it's trying to pick off eggs and probably young chicks before they get to a certain age and they can't grab them. And they're very very curious. They are very curious. When you set something down, if you turn your back and you're not paying attention, they will try to grab it. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. Uh, just a few more species here. So. Uh, a blackish oyster catcher obviously looks a lot like the oyster catcher we see here in the West Coast in the United States. And then in terms of penguins, again, so king penguins, and these are both king penguins. So that's an adult. This is what they look like 
uh, as they're growing up before they get to the point where they can kind of go out on their own. And that takes a couple of years, which is really kind of crazy to think about. Um, and yeah, they're, these, these younger ones, they're really kind of, they almost look like something out of Star Wars is the only way I guess I can describe it, right? Almost like a Chewbacca kind of looking thing. Uh, yeah, it's all down, right? So, you know, they're not, they haven't got, they're a long ways from getting their, you know, their juvenile feathers and their adult feathers, right? There's a whole molt situation that has to take place over the course of two years. But these adult king penguins, and again, at this location, I forget what the number is, but I want to say it's maybe 100 king penguins, and it might not even be that many. So there's not a lot of king penguins. It's a lot more gentoos and a lot more rock hoppers, as you're going to see. But these king penguins are really, really cool to watch, uh, a lot of fun to photograph. And uh, yeah, it's just a really cool experience when you are seeing penguins. And, you know, it's a flightless bird, too. That's how you kind of almost forget at a certain point. It's like, oh, it's a bird. <laughs> you know? It's like, that's a bird, right? Um, and they can be, you know, very kind of comical in ways and, and, and some more comical than others. And I will say, you know, the king penguins are the largest of what we saw. To me, the rock hoppers, which were the smallest, they were the coolest to really watch. They had more personality, if I could use that word. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. A king penguin, they probably stands about that tall. You know, it's, you know. And they can stretch their necks even like, you know, like, like a green hair and sometimes you can hear it's like scrunched and then like, it goes like, you know, like, well, it's like an accordion, right? So, yeah. Um, so the rock hopper, so that, that big beach that you saw, like off to the far right side, there's this whole cliff that kind of goes up and the, 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 the absolutely insane thing, and I, the more I think about it, even to this day, is that these rock hoppers, there's these cliffs. So these rock hoppers are making their way from the ocean and it's the water is battering them and then they got to get up on the rocks and it's slippery and then they're going to climb all the way up this cliff which is like a hundred feet high and you're like what is going on there this this it's like in, it's insane and and yet they're just coming out of the ocean you know 10 at a time or 20 at a time it was really kind of crazy and they're making their way up these cliffs and there's the black belt albatross in there and uh um, the Comorans that are there. They, they, it's, it's, the whole scene is just, is, like I said, it's just crazy. The other interesting thing about this little location, and we sp I spent a few hours there one afternoon, was I noticed on the side of the rocks, this is all from the rock hoppers, because they actually have like this really big kind of nail that sticks out of their, of their feet, right? And, and that's how they're grabbing onto and not slipping on and sliding all over the place. And yet they've carved over, I don't know what, thousand years or more, <laughs> whatever it is, I don't know. I don't, I don't, that part I don't, and you can see what they've done to the rocks. It's, it's really kind of mind blowing. And by the way, so for, for this particular trip, I, I, I shoot Canon equipment. So I had a Canon, two Canon R3 bodies. I did not take my super telephoto, which is 600. There's no need for that whatsoever. The largest lens I had was a, the new mirrorless 100 to 500 millimeter lens. I had a 24 millimeter lens and a 24 to 70. I wish, I have a fairly old iPhone. I wish I had bought the new iPhone because that is an iPhone photo. And you're gonna see several iPhone photos. And in fact, that is an iPhone photo. <laughs> and you're gonna see that in a minute. So even if you're not a photographer and you said, I'm not gonna bring a camera and I'm just, I have a, a new, you know, good, smartphone and iPhone or whatever Android version, like you could go there and do this. Like it, it's that doable, right? Okay, so on to some more penguins. So Gentoos, lots of Gentoos that are nesting here. Um, and they're doing this thing, you know, where they're, they're picking up rocks and they're making a nest. Where they think there's not, you know, it's just like, oh, we'll drop a rock here and we'll drop a rock here. It's just like, I'm not really sure what you're doing there, but okay, I guess it works for you. And the young that had hatched there were much younger than the young that had hatched at the next location, which were much further along, which I thought was kind of curious. So we're in the Falklands, but yet the next location's uh, sea lion, they were probably at least two or three weeks ahead of them in terms of the growth of the chicks, which we thought was kind of curious. And so there, there's always one at the nest with the young because when they're maybe not this young, but certainly a little bit younger, they have to worry about those brown skuas coming in. Okay, so we're still on Saunders. So now we got to drive back all the way back to where we where we flew in. 
And our good buddy Dave, who I introduced you to, picks us up. And now we got to drive all the way out to the other side of the island to where it's called the Rookery. And so you're staying here. And then, yeah. And then you've got to hike about 35 minutes or so out to this location here. Now, there is stuff to photograph along the way. And there's black, black, black browed albatross kind of almost all the way along this cliff face. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So you make your way from your new accommodations. We have an upgrade. <laughs> it's a little bit nicer. And I will say it was it was actually much nicer. This is just a shot of the bedroom before we left. I, I actually had a, a shot of the, the common area. Um, the accommodations were much nicer. This is a newer building. Very nice. Uh, if I stayed in this and some of the remote places I've been, I would be thrilled any place I went. So from here, again, so this is the cabin. This is the old location where the researchers used to stay, which is a little one of those, um, uh, like like a storage unit or something. It's all rotted out and whatever. Um, and then we looked inside and like, I can't believe someone actually stayed there. But anyway, you make your way al along the path and, and a little bit of what, what is still a road that they will sometimes drive. And there's these flags along the way that kind of help guide you to make you, you know, get your way all the way out to the, to the rookery. Otherwise, I don't know that I would have found it as easily because even though they said, go that way and you'll find it. As at one point, I'm like, you know, 20 minutes into the hike, I'm like, well, where is this? But, you know, you find it eventually, you know what's going on. So along the way, you're looking out for, for other things. And we did see uh, several of these long-tailed metal arcs. And we saw these, I think, in almost every location that we visited. Uh, really cool bird. Um, this one was particularly uh, cooperative and got some, uh, some fairly nice photos of it. And again, more brown skuas. Brown skuas everywhere. These things are really prolific. Um, there's only one raptor species we saw. We'll look at that more towards the end. But these guys are predators and they're out there kind of, you know, doing their thing. So lots of brown skuas. And in some places it was kind of staggering how many brown skuas there were. Experience. On a brown skua, that's got to be, you know, a good four and a half, five feet, um, I would say. And like I said, they're very curious and, you know, for a lot of these other bird species, they don't mess with them. You know, they're, they're formidable. And so you make your way up over this hill and you come down, you're, you, you enter the area where you see the first part of this rookery. And this is almost, it's not all rock hoppers because there are imperial comorants in here as well, but there's a lot of them. And there's kind of two different, you know, areas where they are. Um, that's my friend Christopher, just to give you a little sense of scale of what's going on here. And so these rock hoppers, a lot of personality, they're really cool bird. And, and again, you can see on their feet here, and I, I had showed you earlier where they clawed into the side of the, the rocks there. You can see how, how that's happening, right? Um, and, and these rock hoppers at this location, they're coming up even more of a cliff and more of a distance to travel. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And you know they're considerably smaller than a king penguin, but they're much more mobile. And they, you see them, they're actually hopping and they're, they're uh, to use a basketball uh, analogy, they're, they're catching air <laughs> when they're doing their thing. It's really kind of cool. Uh, and so there's a couple of other locations that we were turned on to in this area to check out. And one is called um, the Penguin Shower. Uh, That's my buddy, Sam. Um, I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania originally. It's my buddy, Sam, who's from Erie, and my buddy, Scott. So you kind of climb down the side of the, of the cliff and it's, you know, as long as it's not too windy, the second day, too windy, we didn't do it. Um, if you got a little too far out, you know, 150 feet down into the ocean. So, you know, you got to just got to kind of watch what you're doing. But once you get here, you're fine. And the birds are completely like, they, you're almost invisible. It's crazy. They just kind of go about their thing. And, and, and this is the shower. And so they're all trying to make their way into this area in here. And there's a, another spot down here. And there's just water, fresh water that's dripping down. So when they come out of the ocean, they go in and they kind of do their thing. And I have a bunch of slow motion video, which I hope to put on my website at some point, but just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on here. And so you can get a better sense. Of, and they're all kind of jockeying for space, right, to, to get their shower. And, and it's really, it's really cool. And it's just nonstop. And they'll spend, each penguin, once they kind of get their spot where they're taking their shower, they'll spend four or five minutes, maybe a little bit more, and then they go on and then the next group comes in and just keeps rotating. It doesn't stop. I mean, you could sit there probably all day and it probably doesn't stop. And, and my buddy Scott, again, this is right next to the, the, the shower is kind of just behind and off to the, to the left. Um, and it's just, yeah. And then and once they go through the shower, they make their way, continue to make their way here. 
and all the way up, and you can see them here, and they're going all the way up, and that area where you saw all this, that's where they're going, right? So they just came like 100 feet up the cliff, took the shower, and now they got another, I don't know, probably 300 feet to go up this path and then to get to where their nesting colony is. And here's one catching air right here, right? And so they're just, again, they're just all marching through. It's just, it's nonstop. It's just like, you know, someone opened the floodgates and, they, and there they go. And, and this is not a great photo. My buddy took me up, took my, this photo of me. This is where I think I'm actually photographing the albatross, but this is part of the cliff face that I'm talking about. So you can't really tell, but like, like right over there, it's like, yeah, it's a hundred feet down. <laughs> Okay, so uh, black-browed albatross, lots of albatross here. This is the place to see and photograph the albatross. Um, Saunders Island is the only place, you can see them in other locations, but you're not gonna photograph them because this is the only place we have access to the nesting colonies that we went to. And again, the side of the, the cliff here, and they are really just an absolutely stunning bird, particularly when you see them in flight and yeah, we just, I, the one afternoon, I think we spent almost three hours just in the one location, just kind of observing and photographing. They have a huge wingspan. We'll talk about that and you'll see that in a second. And so you're just kind of just taking it all in. It's just like, it's this cacophony of sounds and all the, the visuals of what's going on in the ocean. And it's, it's kind of otherworldly. And you're just waiting for something to happen and, and just observe what you see in all these documentaries that you see on TV, and then all of a sudden it happens in front of you, and you're like, oh my God, that just happened. <laughs> you know? uh, they have they can be up to an eight foot wingspan, thereabouts, it might even be a little bit more. And, and, and you're on the side of that cliff, and in this case, I mean, they're, they're flying at eye level with you. So you're not doing this, you're doing this, right? Which is what was going on here, or maybe this, just slight angle, right? So. Yeah, right, exactly, right, yes, good point. <laughs> okay, so from there, we're gonna make our way to Sea Lion Island. And so this particular island, unlike Saunders Island, which was privately owned, Sea Lion Island is owned by uh, the Falkland Islands, by the government. And it is a... I forget the actual designation. I think it might be in a photo of the sign. I have a wildlife sanctuary, I think they might call it. We'll see in a second here. Anyway, it's a very large island, but you're spending pretty much the bulk of your time, you're spending it kind of on this beach here and this beach here. And at one point we were driven up way over here to go see the fifth penguin species, which is macaroni penguin. We'll get to that in a second. But really, all, all of our time is really just spent right in here. So all of the islands that you land on have the airstrip. So when you land, you get greeted, and um, you're whisked off to, to your accommodations. In this case, it was right next to the airstrip. Oh, here it is. Na National Nature Reserve, that's what they call it. Um, this particular island, there are two people that have the lease to run the lodge. Great lodge, fantastic lodge, you'll see in a second. This guy, Mickey, who is from Scotland, great naturalist, really good birder. And I was told, not by him, but the woman who also runs the lodge with him, that during COVID, he spent two and a half years on the island, did not leave the island for two and a half years. And, and by the way, he was fine with that, apparently. Um, the, the rest of the staff is seasonal that come from Chile, which is the chef and the people that do housekeeping and all the rest of it. There's about six people, so not a lot of people. So in the other half of the year, it's just the two of them that live there. So again, not a lot of people living on some of these islands. Uh, this is the front part of the lodge itself, a very nice lodge. And a lot of times right out front, you're hanging out in these striated caracaras. Um, they're even more curious in some cases than the skuas. Uh, and this particular one was always kind of hanging out on the picking table, which is right in front of the lodge. And so I did a selfie with them. Uh, you walk into the lodge itself and it's just, it's a really nice place. Uh, food was very good. Um, common kitchen area, a lot more people staying here. The other two locations were the only ones staying there. Now we arrive here and there's probably, um, you know, 25 people, or maybe a little bit more. And people are kind of coming and going depending on what days they're there and so forth. 
nice common area with uh, with a bar fully stocked, you know, coffee, tea, snacks, the whole nine yards. Uh, they really have this this whole thing down in terms of the ecotourism thing here. Very nice combinations as far as, far as the rooms are concerned. The water pressure on the showers, however, that was <laughs> sometimes could be a little bit little, like a little more than a trickle. So that was the only kind of downside there. Okay, on to the birds. Uh, uh, two banded plover. So the plover species that we saw in a lot of locations, this was almost kind of always the default uh, plover that we were seeing. Um, and always kind of in these, these beach areas, typically, at least on, on this particular island. Uh, and just a few more uh, species here. And some very nondescript birds like, like this one here, uh, but lots of them, very curious. And then lots of waterfowl, just very quickly go through. So upland uh, goose, I think this is the male and the female. Kelp goose, speckled teal, crested duck. You don't see the crest up. Lots of these in some of these small ponds that were on the island. And then this was a cool one. Only saw uh, two or three of them. Uh, this uh, Chileo uh, widgeon, uh, they were uh, much more skittish than the other ones, but a really uh, cool looking uh, uh, duck to see. And then the Falkland steamer duck, which is a flightless duck. And, and these three young, and at one point, uh, this female chased another steamer duck for like 20 minutes and left these three young alone in the middle of the ocean. And then they all waddled up on shore and sat there and waited for their mother. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like a skua, you know, like, I mean, like anything could come. Nope. She was just like, they're, they're fine. And she came back and they were totally fine. I was like, this insane. <laughs> and they're flightless. <laughs> uh, white bridle French, uh, lots of these out in, in, in kind of the, the interior area. I think this, this, um, this uh, uh, vegetation is, I think it's deedle D. I think it's what it referred to. Does that ring a bell to you? No, anyway, um, lot, lots of the, but lots of these white bridled finch kind of, they're all out there and the males were singing and it was really kind of cool. Uh, here's a cool one, this uh, dark faced brown tyrant. And these tended to be more along the coastline. Uh, not a lot of them, but you certainly were seeing them, you know, pretty regularly. Uh, obviously it looks a lot like our robin. It's, it's the brush that you see there. And again, kind of not on the coast area, but in, in the interior area, lots of these uh, thrush around. So there's, there's lots of bird life there other than, than the penguins. So of course, when you get to the, to the areas where the penguins are, there's more of them. South American snipe. Uh, and they were, they were very, uh, they were fairly common in, in a lot of the areas, again, uh, kind of interior areas. And unlike, I think a lot of the snipe that we see here, uh, again, all these birds down it, they could absolutely care less. I mean, we were, I think we were, my buddy Christopher and I were lying on the ground and at one point, like, one of these two came within like a foot of me. I couldn't photograph it, right? It came within like a foot of me and was just continuing to forage. And I'm just kind of sitting there looking at it, right? Uh, striated caracaras, lots of striated caracaras on this particular island. And they do research on the striated caracaras here. That gentleman from Hawk Mountain used to go here pretty regularly. There's another woman that's taken over that research program. And um, so anyway, lots of these striated caracaras uh, here on the island. Just a couple pictures of them. Really cool looking bird. Okay, so not clearly not a bird. <laughs> so uh, Southern elephant seals, lots of these elephant seals on sea lion island, not a sea lion. We're gonna get to that in a second. There's more Southern elephant seals on sea lion island than there are sea lions. I don't know why they didn't get that, but anyway. Most of the really big dominant males by the time we had arrived, had already bailed out. So these are really large, but I was told that like the dominant beach master ma males that are that would have been there had we been there a month earlier, they're even larger than these, which I like could not even wrap my head around because these things were freaking enormous. This is a young one. That's the one I took with my phone. I was just kind of walking along and it was sitting there. I just kind of took the phone out and click and just kept on walking. More brown skuas, and I actually have a whole video, uh, slow motion video of this whole mating thing that happened with the two of them. Oh, that's the wrong, I had the wrong text up there, sorry. Uh, yes, yes. So um, most of these birds are not migratory. 
the penguins are only coming in and, and coming on shore for nesting season, but with the king penguins, uh, the young, because that's a two year period, that's a longer period where the adults are coming and going. Um, but most of these other birds you're seeing here, no, they're, they're pretty much year round. And by the way, there, there, so there is, on this island, there was one um, endemic bird and now I'm drawing, it's a wren, a uh, Cobb's wren, and I could not photograph it. Um, so there's one species that we got there that like, that's the only, one of the few places you can see it is on that particular island. And they're all in the Falklands. Uh, Magellanic oyster catcher obviously looks a lot like our American oyster catcher we see here. Um, and again, all along the shoreline, they were, uh, they were fairly common. Again, more of the snipe. And so now onto the penguins. So this, so there's several of these Gen 2 penguin nesting colonies uh, on sea lion and two of them are within a two minute walk of the lodge itself. You literally open up the door, you go one direction or the other and you run into this. Um, this is one of the smaller ones. And I spent uh, quite a bit of time here because it was a nice place to, to shoot a lot of video as well. And so that is the setup that I'm primarily using. So that's a 100 to 500. That's the microphone. When I was re if I were recording slow motion, there's no audio. But if I was not recording slow motion, and you have to have a windscreen, otherwise you're not going to hear anything. Like yeah, they again, they're just kind of like, hey, whatever, man. We're all we're all here, you know. <laughs> and as you're as you're as you're sitting there, you never know what's going to happen. My buddy Scott and this uh, this Kara Kara again, very curious, decides he's got to check out what's going on with uh, with Scott's lens. So. That was taken with my iPhone too, by the way. <laughs> but as you're sitting there, so there's there's that's called the, the 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 penguin highway, right? It's this path that it goes from there out to the beach, and you're kind of and then and there's like a whole rush of them, you know, just come barreling through, and then there's a pause, and there's a whole bunch more that come through. And I did a whole thing with my GoPro where I set it down in one area where the high the highway was, and set it on slow motion. I have all this video of them running by, which I hope to get that out at some point as well. Uh, they're always on guard for for the for the uh, for the caracaras, and they let them know it. But these caracaras at this point, they're not going to they're not going to kill these young. They're, they were too big at this point. That was not going to happen. And the adults, you know, they don't leave them unattended. So it, it was just more of a reaction thing. You know, they got too too close to the uh, to the nest. And just a couple of shots here. So over to the the North Beach. So. This is the path they want the people to take, and just to the right of that is where the Penguin Highway is. So they're, they're kind of, you can almost tell it kind of diverges right there. Right? So um, you get onto the beach, and so now you've got all these penguins that are coming off the ocean. Most most of them being these Gen Twos and kind of making their way uh, up to the, the the nesting colonies. Although we did have a couple of king penguins on the beach, they don't nest there. Uh, snowy sheep bill. This is actually a shorebird. Uh, and we had a flock of about, I don't know, 15 or 20 that flew in the one afternoon. And they're just running around in front of us for probably a half hour, 45 minutes. Southern giant petrels, huge bird, enormous bird. Oh my God. And by the way, I, I am not, I don't do well in boats. So I don't do pelagic trips. So all these seabirds that I've seen at all, most of the seabirds that I've seen, I have to see them from land. So it was really cool to see these um, these giant petrels, and we actually had one that was just sitting on the beach at one point. I, I did I added text the other day, and I didn't double check. That is not a snowy sheep bill. That's a Gen two pink. So anyway, they they come onto the beach, and they're doing this thing where they're like they're they're they hit the beach, and they're kind of like running on their front and back flippers like that to kind of get the motion going before they, they stand upright. So it's, it's really kind of cool to watch. And then once they, I did it again, I gotta go back and change that. But out in the water, what they're doing is they do this thing called porpoising, where they're, where they're actually uh, catching air in the water. And then the other thing, and you can see it already up in the upper right-hand corner, this is the place to see the killer whales as well. Lots of seals, killer whales. And we saw lots of killer whales. Most of them not on this particular beach, but on the next beach we're gonna look at, and that's a killer. And there was probably three or four killer whales out here. And so they get an idea of this whole porpoising thing, which is really cool to watch. Really difficult to photograph. I didn't really get many, what I would consider good photos, but good enough. 
Uh, you do have Magellanics because there are a lot of them nesting in there as well. So these Magellanics uh, are also hitting the beach and, and marching their way up the Penguin Highway. But uh, for the most part, it's these, uh, it's these Gen 2s that are coming out of the water. So over to the South Beach, so we're kind of going in the other direction now. Uh, and there's another uh, Gen 2 penguin colony off to the right here. Um, and there's a lot of this tussock grass, this really tall tussock grass that's there, which has now grown up over the last 10, 15 years or more, because um, before they turned it into this nature reserve, there were, I guess there were a couple of, still a couple of horses that were on the island, I was told. And they had literally, those in the sheep that were there, had gnawed all the grass down to like that, like, like there was nothing, right? And within 10 years, this is what happens to the point where like in areas like you could not walk through it. And, and by the way, you would not want to walk through it because you might not find your way out. And I'm not kidding. You literally might not find your way out. And so now these Magellanics like this. So they kind of nest in some of these areas right along on the edge of there. And they do this thing with their brain and they, they kind of uh, almost sound like a, like a donkey as their, as their name or whatever. It's really very, very cool, very cool to watch. And so you make your way out to, to this part of the beach here and you're up on this cliff and you can see all this tuss tussock grass here. And this is what's called the orca pool. And this is where you, you will see, I think every day we saw a, a killer rare. We were delayed one day for the weather. So we had an extra day here, which cut a day off at the other location we went to. Um, we probably saw a couple dozen killer whales here. We never saw a kill that we did not witness, but apparently that, like, that's not unusual to see. Uh, we did not. Um, the other thing we were told is when, when we got up here into this tussie grass, it's like, okay, you're going out there tomorrow morning, the first day? Yeah, yeah, we're going to go. Okay, you got to watch out for Mr. Grumpy Pants. Huh, what? Yeah, there's this, uh, this young elephant, uh, this young uh, sea lion. He got kicked out of the, the main sea lion colony. He's not like, He's not one of the big bruisers, but he's pretty big, you know, and like, so he's now hanging out with the, uh, with the elephant seal. So you got to watch out for him. He's really ornery. Really? Like how ornery? Oh, like he could kill you. Oh, uh, excuse me? Yeah, he, he could rip your head off and your legs and your arms and he'd disembowel. Oh, okay. Oh, great. But we'll watch out for him. So, <laughs> so everyone's up on the side of the cliffs. I get there. Okay. Anybody seen Mr. Grumpy Pants? Oh yeah, he's over there. Okay, great. We're safe. So this is what it, it kind of looks like down in that, that area. And so my buddy Christopher and I, Oh, sorry. So it's a little whale shot here. That's Mr. Grumpy Pants right there. So prior to this photo, we had actually gone down here to, to take some photos off this way of him. And he was quite a ways back. He's big. We got a big telephoto lens. We, we were safe. There was, there was no issue there. But that's Mr. Grumpy Pants. I don't know what he weighed, but I'm going to guess he was north of 700 pounds. This is the crazy thing. I had n absolutely no idea how fast they are because we had seen these elephant seals and they're like, you know, my grandmother's deceased. I love my grandmother. My grandmother could have outrun an elephant seal, okay? Mm -hmm. Not a sea lion. So one, you can see he's given us a stink eye here. Well, he decided he had had enough from Christopher and I. And once he got up and did this, I took two shots and we were right up the side of that cliff. And then you saw that picture where he was down below. We were having no, none of him. And that's where he sat down below kind of looking at us. And yeah, he, he was very ornery. I guess he's cute. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, these are, the, are the, uh, the elephant seals. This is a younger one here. And they are extremely curious. And particularly these young. So we're just sitting on the beach here, and I got a whole series of photos of this young one uh, walking up to Chris or walking up, waddling up to, to Christopher uh, as Christopher was taking some photos here. And that just gives you a, a more sense of like how, how big one half of the beach is. It goes the other direction, like, you know, several hundred yards. But that's, that's the area we would spend a lot of time photographing down in here. So I, I did a whole series of photos and videos of these, uh, these young uh, males as they're sparring. And this was not serious combat, by the way. I mean, and this is just them trying to figure out like what the pecking order is. And my buddy Christopher took this photo of me taking that photo of them. And so I've got a 24 millimeter lens there. So I'm trying to get this really wide shot of them. 
And that was another thing I realized is that I don't often use a 24 millimeter lens, which is a very wide angle lens, right? To photograph wildlife, because in most cases, the wildlife does not let you approach closely. In this case, they could really care less. And, you know, I'm not, we're not touching them. We're not interfering with them. And so as I'm sitting in this one location here along the, uh, the edge of, of this beach, this young one, again, waddles up and is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I got my 20 film mineral lens. I turn around and I take this, this shot. And it's one of my favorite shots of the trip is just a much different view for the viewer to kind of take the whole thing in. And so uh, I think this is the last one. So this is one of the larger of the Gen 2 uh, penguin colonies there, nesting colonies there. And, and this is, the one, is one that's actually, you have to go buy this one on the way to the beach we just went. So on the way back, this one's here. And um, by the way, um, just a, a total side note, uh, up in here is a woman who was uh, a school teacher who was one of the civilians that was killed in the war with Argentina. She is buried here. She's not from there. She's just buried there. Which I kind of was like, oh, she thought she must she must have spent no 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 she just liked the place she wanted to be buried there they buried her there, go you can go up I have photos of the grave and everything I think her name was Susan, this is with twenty four millimeters as well so again just give you a kind of a nice sense of scale of what's going on here and then you go in tight with the telephoto and these Gen two penguins again these young here right they're 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 larger than we were than here than they were on Saunders Island which we just came from, and just a few photos of them and again the uh, the caracaras getting in there and then with the wide angle again i got up nice and close and got this feeding and 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 so this penguin is not squawking at me it's squawking at another caracara that's just about to approach and it's not in the field of view they, they could care less about humans like they just like don't care okay we're just about to end the last part of 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 Sea Lion Island. So I told you we got the fifth species of penguin, which is uh, the macaroni penguin. So you could have walked from the lodge there, but it would have taken you over an hour. And I was not particularly interested in walking over an hour in one direction and over an hour in another direction uh, back to the lodge. So the last day before we were flying out in the afternoon, Mickey says, hey, I'll take you up. You guys can see the macaroni penguin and, you know, whatever. The weather was, was like some of the worst weather we had for it, but whatever. So we get up there and there's this, this small um, colony of, of rockhopper penguins and almost dead center, and he's, he's actually right there, is this macaroni penguin, a male, a lone male, who is king of the hill. He's right in the center, he is king of the hill. And he has like the yellow on his head for these feathers is much more pronounced. And his, his beak, his bill is, is, is larger, uh, a little thicker. He, he stands out. Like when you saw him next to a rock hopper, you're like, that's not a rock hopper, right? And he's a little bit bigger. And, and he's kind of like, rock hoppers were bully other rock hoppers. Like no rock hopper was going near this guy. Like that was not happening. Lone male, he's been coming there for a few years. So that was our fifth. We got one more macaroni at the next location. And there's another story that's even more interesting than that one. So I'm gonna keep plowing ahead. Okay, Bleecker Islands. So this island privately owned uh, by this couple in their seventies. And the woman was a, a school teacher in the Falklands for many years and had some sort of other government position. Really, really interesting. I think I have a picture of her coming up. And on Bleecker, we spent uh, our time on this beach here, which you'll see in a minute. And then over here, these cliffs where there's a rock hopper and Imperial Comorant uh, colony, and then a bunch of Imperial Comorants that nest here. And you're gonna see that in a second, but this particular, oh, here it is, yeah. So this is where we're staying. And from here, we could walk right over to this rock hopper colony. Oh, it's over here. We could rock, walk over to that one. That was, that was fine. Uh, we did get use of a vehicle so we could drive over the beach because it was a little too far. And then there was also sea lions they were in this other place over here that we look at. So you arrive in, in, in Bleecker on, on the airstrip, which is the other side of the island. And um, the young man who's the son of the owners who runs the whole eco thing, him and his wife, um, he picks you up. And this is the woman I was talking about. Her and her husband own the island. They bought it back in the 
late 80s, I believe. Um, ecotourism was like not a thing when they bought it. It was sheep. Uh, the son decides like, hey, we're going to cash in on this. Which I think this is a good thing. But he had to implement a whole eradication of rats. Apparently, the island was just like just way, 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 way too many rats. And so it was a whole process to get the rats. And he's pretty sure at this point there are no rats on the island. Um, I wish I could remember her name, but she was really cool. We had a great conversation with her. And she was so thrilled because she had just bought that Land Rover. And like she had wanted her for years. And it was like we got to drive in the land. And she was driving the Land Rover. And I was sitting right next to her. It was really cool. And so this is what it looks like when you get four photographers and all their equipment and camera gear and all that sort of stuff, right? <clears throat> Uh, this is the accommodations. Fantastic lodge. I mean, this place is really uh, sea lion. Very nice. This is newer, uh, equally as nice, if not nicer. Really nice accommodations here. I mean, you know, you you are doing very well when you walk in the front door here. And by the way, again, the food was very good. Excellent uh, accommodations in terms of the bedrooms and uh, water pressure on the showers. Again, <laughs> don't know what that's all about. We get the Falklands, but whatever. Okay, uh, again, Magellanic oyster catchers. Uh, we had them in, in several of these locations. We have a, a bunch of these freshwater ponds, which was nice, which would attract a lot of birds. Uh, this is within a stone's throw of, of where the, lo the, the lodges that we were staying at. And this is an Imperial Comorant uh, colony that's on the island. And I don't know how many birds there, but it's a lot. It's a lot of birds. And this one evening I was walking back, it was like all this, uh, commotion going on and whatever the school is almost all this is school is flying in and out and trying to steal eggs this is next to it and this is what i guess what happened so they use this area and they build their nest and at a certain point they come back the next year and i don't know who decides i don't know if there's like a straw pole or something and you know they go okay hey you know we're not using that one we're moving you know that and oh by the way back here is like the you know five years or 10 years before, which is degraded more than this. It's it's like crazy. And when I saw this, I was like, I have to take a picture of that to show people, otherwise you can't explain it, right? Again, lots of schoolers, brown schoolers. Uh, and, and by the way, more schoolers here on this island than we saw in all the other locations. It was like, we were commenting at one point, it's like, I don't know, like, what are they, how much can they find to eat? I mean, I get there's a lot of nesting birds, but like, that's a lot of schoolers. There must've been hundreds of them. And, and again, you know, two banded plovers. And unlike the, the ones before on the beaches, this was on this kind of just off the, the I mean, the, the, the coastline is not too far away, but it's like, it almost looks like a putting green they were on. It was really kind of interesting. And there was probably, I don't know, three or four dozen of these plovers. They were all just running around. And I was like, oh man, what's going on here? I just like threw everything to the ground and got down ground level and started taking these photos. Righty headed goose, that's a, a pretty goose. This is the only raptor that we saw, uh, and I almost didn't see it. I, I, I went out um, the afternoon before we left and went in the opposite direction of any place we'd ever, anybody had gone in my group and just said, I'm going to go down here, whatever. And I just started walking, and that's where I got that plover, and I ran into this, this hawk. And again, like a lot of these birds, including this raptor, it was just like, yeah, whatever, man. And I just was hanging out with it for about 15 or 20 minutes, and it could care less. Uh, lots of Magellanic uh, penguins on this island and in various locations. And the, and the interesting thing here is how far inland that they will go coming off of the coast to actually go to where they're nesting. And you're going to see that in a second. And you're going to scratch your head because when you see the photo, you're like, really? And which is what I said. But anyway, you'll see in a second. Uh, so, I don't know. Why. Oh, I see. Okay. So I wanted to get the orient again. So, from here, we're gonna go back over to uh, the cliffs over here where there's this huge uh, colonies of, of these imperial comorants and these rock hoppers. And you know, these cliff faces here, again, in some places, they're probably 100, 150 feet down to the ocean. But you can just kind of, I just kind of walked a lot of this area, not where the birds were, and you can just kind of step yourself along. It's, uh, I, I didn't feel like it was unsafe at all at any point, but that's just give you a sense of scale and the view that you're looking at. And off to this direction here is where one of the larger rock hopper colonies, and there's another one kind of up over here that you can't see. Uh, but really just stunning, stunning uh, scenery here. And so this is the colony itself. 
part of it. And you just, again, just want to get a sense of like what you're looking at and, and kind of what's going on here. And lots and lots of these imperial comments right in with the rock hoppers, which I thought was kind of interesting. And they, for the most part, get along. I, I kind of try to ignore each other uh, as much as possible. But it's the only analogy I can give with the rock hopper penguins. Uh, um, does anybody here have hummingbird feeders? Okay, and you've been to places where you like maybe out west where you, uh, in Arizona or wherever the hummingbird feeders and like hummingbird comes to a feeder and is like, dude, there's 10 more feeders over here. You don't have to have an argument with the guy next to you, right? These rock hopper penguins are like, like they're, they're constantly like, oh, we're gonna go beat this guy up. No, we're gonna go beat this guy. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing? It's like, there's plenty of space here, right? So anyway. So the reason I show this photo is I wanted you to get a sense here. I intentionally put my boot in there. That's with my iPhone. They will walk right up to you. They are so curious. They want to know, like, who are you? What are you doing? And at one point, I have this video. They like to present, like, little sticks and things to, like, their mate or whatever. And there's one. I watched him. He picked up the stick, and he ran right towards me. And he's got the stick, right? And he gets up to me, and he realizes, oh, you're not a penguin. And he drops it. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I got to encompass that, that video, but in, in this program. But anyway, so yeah, they're just, I mean, they're all in here just kind of like, you know, doing their thing. They're nesting, right? It's, it's, and it's this whole cacophony of sounds and, and smells. <laughs> but you're in the wrong direction on the wind, you get the smell. Um, but again, I like that wide angle and kind of what that gives you and the view here. And I think there's just a couple of shots here with the babies. Um, that was the one. And, and, and this is what I was saying earlier about the personality, right? So this is no disrespect to the king penguins. This is no disrespect to the Magellanics or the Gentoos. It's like, they're all really cool. Like penguins are just like crazy cool. They just are, these rock hoppers have so much personality and they let you know it. And this photo for me kind of like encompasses that like attitude that they have about, hey, we might be tiny, but man, we're really badass and we're cool. And oh, by the way, we just climbed up 150 feet up this cliff to get here. I don't see a king penguin doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and so here is, I told you we're gonna get to the, the next story of the, of the macaroni. This is the second macaroni. So we saw four species of penguins at almost every location. We were told a really good chance of getting that fifth, which was macaroni. We only had two, this is the second. It's also a male. Here's the really cool story. Okay, everyone paying attention because you don't want to miss this, all right? They know it's a male. It had uh, bonded with and mated with a female rock hopper. They had one chick. You can just barely make it out here. And we, we rarely saw it. So, it's a, it's a rock hopper and it's a macaroni. What's it called? <laughs> Anybody? It's a rockaroni. <laughs> it's a rockaroni. So you would come back to the lodge and I forget the woman who, 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 uh, who ran the lodge and she would say, did you see the rockaroni? <laughs> you know, they want to know, like, did you see the rockaroni, right? And so that was the cool thing. So. We got five species and a hybrid. <laughs> so we got six. <laughs> oh, you can see you can see the baby a little bit more here in this one. Again, and we never got great looks at it, unfortunately. But again, you can see here how much bigger, thicker that that bill is, and how much more yellow on those feathers on the crest are. And it's it's a slightly bigger, bulkier bird. And again all these rock hoppers that are like, you know, jostling or whatever, like they're not going near this guy. They're like, they, whoo, hey, we're not, <laughs> not only part of that, you know? Okay. I, uh, I actually don't know the answer to that and I probably should. Probably, I mean, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. You and I got to look that up. I'll email you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so we were taken over to this other location to see, uh, Sea lions, uh, southern sea lions. This particular location, and uh, the woman who helped run the lodge, she drove us over there and she says, look, when you get here, we're gonna be on this area up above. There's a bluff, everyone very quiet, you know. Now there's an, there's an area like, like, like almost like a rise that comes up. 
that you could walk to get there. She says, no one can go down on the beach, just stay up there. She said, but if one of them starts to make their way up, everyone's got to bail out. So we got, we got there and we had about 40 minutes or so and all this activity going on as a baby. And they're just, it's just all this commotion with them. Like they just, these males don't stop like wrestling is the best way I can put it. They're just constantly at each other. And then the males, these big dominant males, there's a handful of them in there. They're constantly bossing around the females and the females are like, you know, get away from me, you know, and like stay away from my pup and that sort of thing. Uh, and at one point, about 40, 45 minutes, here comes this young male and he was fairly, he wasn't like one of the big bruisers. He starts making his way up and you cannot believe how much ground they can make from point A to point B like that. And we were, I was just like, whoa, just like that, that Mr. Grumpy Pants, right? Everyone, we had to bail out and that was it. We, we, were, we were done. Okay, now we're gonna go over to this beach here. <clears throat> this was a really cool beach. And I'm just gonna go through this quickly and so you can get a sense of what's going on here. So uh, Magellanics, lots of Gen 2s, that's really what's going on here. And remember I told you about these, these Gen 2s and like how far they're coming off the coast. And, and I mean, this is, I, this is behind me, right? And I'm looking and they're just like wandering off, like, like a mile inland or something. I'm like, you're like, dude, there's all sorts of real estate here. Why are you going so far? You know, I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not a penguin biologist, but that's what was going on there. But this was just, so we were told this is a, a spot you want to be. And so my buddy, Sam, and you just kind of sit in this area, a couple of, and just watch, sit, wait, and just a whole series of one photo after. And by the way, I took way too many photos. I mean, like whatever the number you have in your head, I can tell you multiply that by 20. Oh, and then again, because it was way too many. All right, so lots of this porpoising going on here again. But the other cool thing is you get, we got bigger groups of them out front as they're kind of swimming by or coming on shore. And then you could also see them in the waves. Now, the camera doesn't pick it up as well, but you get the sense here of what's going on, right? So that was kind of cool. And just the whole experience, again, of what's going on with these Gen 2s and these, these Magellanics that are coming on this beach. And there's hundreds and hundreds of them. You saw that wide shot, that beach goes on for like a mile and it's just, a constant stream of these penguins coming in and out of the water. And much like the, the, the rock hoppers, the, the Gen 2s can also um, squabble as well. Okay, I'm probably over my allotted time, I'm guessing. We're almost done, sorry. This is the first time I go to the program. I'm still trying to figure out like, like what I'm doing here. So in terms of the line. All right, volunteer point, last location. Again, you have to be, they want you to be back kind of on the mainland where you can drive from wherever you are to get to the airport so that you can make your flight. This is one of the most sought after locations to stay. Four people can stay there. It's, a, it's an old farmhouse, which you're gonna see in a second. And it's got this huge beach and this big nesting area here you're gonna see in a minute for hundreds of king penguins. This guy, Derek and his wife, Trudy run it. To get here, when you come off of the road, you can hit a dirt road and then off of the dirt road, it's an hour, more than an hour and a half, not off road, over land. There's not even a road. You really gotta wanna get here. And four people can stay there. From Stanley, you can stay in Stanley and leave at three o'clock in the morning and you can drive with a driver to get there and you can stay half of the day and then drive back. But only four people stay there. And so we had two days here. This is home cooking. It's great. The, the food is excellent. The rooms, two rooms, two beds, very, very like, imagine a farmhouse. That's what you're staying in. Like, this is not the other two kind of swankier lodges. This is down home, right? But very cool. When you get over to where the, the king penguin colony is, they have these, uh, this set up, this is for a windbreak. So that if you're, you're there and you get dropped off for the day or you're out, whatever, you can just get out of the wind. They have a little hut that you can go into uh, and you can just chill out, right? Because if, if the weather conditions go sideways, it'd be a nice place to just you know hang out or whatever. And it's actually a little bit bigger than what you see here because there's another, another section to it. Okay, lots of Magellanics. And unlike these other penguin species we saw, these Magellanics, 
are burrowing. So they're 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 not ground nesters, they're burrowing. So they're in these these holes, almost not quite, but almost like a burrowing owl in a way. So this is how these Magellanics are nesting. Well, that's a whole other thing, right? All the rest of them are like, you know, they're up on, you know, on the terrain, they're doing their thing. So one of the things that I do wherever I go is I photograph dead things. What's my thing? Oh, that's kind of a morbid thing to do, Sean. Well, I, maybe it is, but I do it because, you know, nature is sometimes not pretty and it's not, peng penguins are cute. Like we all get it, right? But penguins are being eaten by things and in many cases, penguins aren't making it. And so um, this is right within the, the king penguin colony and there were several, you know, carcasses that were there. And I just thought it was kind of a really, it was a good reminder of what nature can and is about, right? Okay, on to cheerier things. <laughs> this is part of the king penguin colony. It's enormous. And I have to say that as a photographer, I'm going to tell you that I failed as a photographer to really capture this the way I want it. Because I got up there as a photographer, I'm quite often looking at a scene and I'm trying to figure out how do I capture this? How do I really express what's going on? And when I got here, I struggled for a half an hour or more, different angles there, and I could not, it just like, it did not come to me. This is the best I could do. And then I saw a couple of photos that my friend Christopher took. He nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. And I saw it afterwards. I'm like, why didn't I see that? And I'm gonna have to ask Christopher to borrow one of his photos just so I can show people and compare. But regardless, you get a sense of what this is. And this is not the entire colony, but this is a lot of it. And again, the, uh, the Star Wars characters, these young, and so there's lots of them here too, right? And they're all kind of wandering around and getting in these groups and that sort of thing. But down on the beach is where we did most of our photography. So two things here is I wanted to, to get a point, the, the idea of A, how windy it is. And you get a little sense there with that sand, right? Blowing on, on, on Christopher's legs and on his back. What you don't get the sense of here, and my buddy Mike had told us about this because he had been here before, is he said, you're going to get there onto Volunteer Beach. And he said, you are not going to believe how fine the sand is. He says, I don't care where you've been in the world. And I've been to a lot of places with sandy beaches. He said, whatever beach you think you've, you, you've experienced, the, the finest grains of sand, he says, it's nothing compared to what you're going to experience here. And he was right. It was like when we got there, we all had the same reaction, which was, yeah, Mike was right again. <laughs> you know, like we, we could not really imagine it was this, but yet it was. And so the whole thing is just kind of going on with these king penguins and gentoos and Magellanics, but mostly king penguins kind of coming and going up and down the beach. And in some cases, they're lying there long enough that, the, that you're just being covered in, and encased in sand. And I have these other photos of this one, or like this young one, it's like almost covered in. Sand and then up and you think, is it dead? And then nope, so it moves a little bit. And at one point they get up and it shakes the sand off. And this was taken with my iPhone. And this is when I um uh, kind of early on in the in the in the morning, I was just like, I had this scene in front of me and I I didn't have my wide angle with me, so I snapped the shot. And what I didn't realize at the time, to kind of bring this a little more in context as to what's going on, my buddy Scott took this photo of me taking that photo you just saw. And so it gives you a, a, a much better sense of just how big this beach is, how kind of violent the ocean is, and yet these penguins are kind of coming and going. And as a photographer, I don't always want the, 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 the subject to fill the frame because that doesn't necessarily always tell as good of a story, right? And so for this, I wanted a photo of, you know, to this tension of it walking out of the of the frame, right? And you see everything that it's come from in the ocean. And it has a sense of tension in a photo like this. And that's what I want to do to kind of get across on this particular photo. And you imagine how turbulent that ocean is. And yet that penguin just like emerges out of that rough water as if like, yeah, it was nothing. And you're just like, that's crazy, you know? And so I'm just gonna just really slam through these photos here. And I, I apologize for probably going too long. But they, they were so cool to photograph. We had an absolutely fantastic day to photograph. And I did these portraits. And so you'll see a, a couple of these portraits here and, and, and these, these adults. And then 
Look at the difference in the in the in the in the bill here in the beak. And they're just marching up and down the beach, and you can see singles, and then you can see how windy it is here with the sand blowing at their feet. It's, it's it's difficult as a photographer when you, when you're trying to get three subjects and like almost on the same plane. Very difficult to do, but like a few of these, and I just I'm just taking you know hundreds of photos just trying to like get this. And I follow these three for probably a half a mile coming up the beach, and every once in a while this one would flop on its belly and kind of do this little crawl thing. And they're just really, really cool. This was first thing in the morning, early morning light here on this one. And they would get into these big groups. And you'll see some of these group shots here. And they, they, they'd be, again, kind of marching down the beach. And, and one was kind of, I guess, maybe leading the pack. And they would make their way down to the water. Nope, and then we're going to go over here. Then we're going to go back. And it's like, this would go on for like, a half a mile or more on the beach. Baseball. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Right? And they're all kind of marching in unison. And again, just to give you a real sense of, of kind of just the, the whole thing that you're experiencing here. And these ones, you know, all coming out of the water at the same time. And I like this one here because you've got these Magellanics with these king penguins, and and, and this is a, this is nice too because it also gives you a little bit more sense of the scale of what the the size difference is. And these king penguins are are quite large. And Magellanic was the first penguin that I saw there, and I remember seeing the Magellanics at Saunders Island when we saw the first few of them. We were driving to the, to the neck, and I had the, the driver Dave stop, and I was like, "We all we all got out of the vehicle. And we're looking at this, and I'm like, wow, that Magellanic penguin is much bigger than I imagined." And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, what? He goes, why do you see a king penguin? <laughs> like, no, just, I just, I imagine them to be smaller for some reason. And so it was an absolutely fantastic adventure. I've been to a lot of places from coast to coast. I've been a lot of other places in the world. I've been to Africa and Iceland and Costa Rica and you name it. And I've been wanting to go here for many, 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 many years. I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad I went with some really good friends to experience all this. All of the people that we met at every location were really just fantastic. The food at every place we went, including the frozen food that they had pre-packaged that we were heating up at the first location was actually pretty good. Um, you know, the accommodations went from really rustic to, you know, really nice to, you know, a farmhouse at the very end, you know? And when it was all said and done, we all talked about it and said, would we go back again? And we were at the airport having that discussion. And this was now we have three days of travel, right? And if I explain, and we have time now, if I explain the three days of travel, it would like you dissuade most of you not to go, right? And we thought about it and like, yeah, we're really glad we went. And if you're asking me now, would I do it again? The answer would be no. And it's not because I didn't have a fantastic time. It's just that you get to the very end and you are completely exhausted. I mean, for us, we were what we did, right? Because we were there. It was over two weeks we were gone, when you include the travel. But what I would say is, and I just real quickly, I'm I'm assuming your trip to the Falklands and when you went on shore to see penguins in particular, you were flabbergasted. Yeah. Most the smell, yes. You get in some places, it's true. Yeah, you don't want to be downwind in certain locations. That that is a given. Yes, yes, no doubt. But but that being said, now that you know, I've had a lot of time away from it. Uh, you know, and the, the, the other thing. So when I when I landed back in Boston, which was on the 18th of December, the next morning, the 19th, I had to drive back to Erie, Pennsylvania, to take care of my father, and I was spent the winter there. I had to get my father in a nursing home. So I went from this really high, high to this somewhat of a low, low. Although things are actually pretty good right now with my father. But, um, and by the way, you don't want to spend a winter in Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm just, you know, <laughs> put that out there. And I love Erie. I'm from here. I love it. But like, the, you know, 
that winter is not where you want to be. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic trip. I would encourage anybody. And by the way, the the, the tour group in the Falklands that we use this uh, Falkland Islands holiday. I mean, you can contact them directly. They make all the accommodations for you. It's it's actually not as expensive as, as you think. I mean, it's not cheap, but it, this is not like Africa money, right? This this is you know, and you don't have to go as many days. You don't have to go as many locations, and you can go and you can stand two feet from penguins, and you will have absolute time of your life and it will be life changing and it will be something that you will absolutely never forget. I can guarantee you. Um, so I appreciate the time. I appreciate the invitation. Sorry, I probably went a little too long. Everybody seemed to stay. So I guess I just, on the edge of your seat anyway. So I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the offer again. Thank you. You went in December, and you said that's the summer. You guys were dressed like Africa. Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is, for those online, so we went in December, which is summer, but we were dressed, obviously, rather um, like it was, you know, kind of winter. I, it was not. It, you know, we, for as much as we looked like we were bundled up, and in some cases we were, you know, the average temperature was probably... 45 there were there were a few occasions where it might have you know got up to, to 50 the wind was the thing right because that you know at a temperature of 45 and i don't know what the water temperature was the wind comes off there at i mean there could be times when it is it is a constant 40 mile an hour wind i mean think about 40 mile an hour wind constant like that is brutal right and there were there were a couple of occasions where it was probably more than 40 miles an hour there was there were there was one morning at Sea Lion Island. I got up and the windsock was like this, and I looked outside. I'm like, what? what? And I walked outside. I'm like, there's no wind. I didn't have a jacket on. I just had my ball cap on. Didn't need my gloves. I spent a whole morning out there. It was like it was great. Sun was out. It was, it was probably 50 degrees. It's fine, you know. Hey, you people are from Maine. You don't care. Yeah, right. fine. You're a hearty bunch. <laughs> So yes, um, I, I would look. I, I've been up to. Uh, I don't know if I'm giving this away, but so I guess I'm scheduled to come back next year. By the way, spoiler alert, to give a talk on Iceland, specifically on the island of Grimsey. So stay tuned. If you have mark it on your calendar, whatever the date is, June. Yep, uh, that's the northernmost island off of Iceland. Hundred people maybe live there. I thought that was the windiest place I'd ever been, right? And we were there in in summer photographing puffins and, you know, guillemots and all that sort of stuff. This was much windier. The temperatures were fairly close, right? So. Did you use earplugs? I did not. I did not. I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily find that necessary. I mean, I, I do have this, this, you didn't see it in the phone. I have this one hat that kind of covers my ears, so. If it was really that windy, you know, because I, I wouldn't just wear my baseball cap then because I didn't have you know, my my ears covered. That was that was usually enough. Yes. Was it a single chick or two? It seemed like you were photographing. So yeah, some of them would it depended on the species. Um I believe with the king penguins it's one for the most part. With the gentoos, a lot of times you saw them with one, but that's not because they didn't have to. It's because probably early on a school probably got the egg or maybe got the chick straight off when it was hatched. But you would see a lot of twos with, with those, the rock hoppers, ones and twos. I'm trying to think if we had any with three or not. I That I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, they're not having, you know, these are not, you know, these aren't, you know, robins with, you know, five babies in a nest sort of thing. Like they, they can't do that. Um, the, so just one other note. Um, so, and I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, that in the Southern Hemisphere right now, um, the, I'm having a brain cramp. There, what's the um, the thing that's killing a lot of these uh, birds along the coast? The, uh, the avian, is it avian flu? I think it is or whatever, right? So that has hit the Southern Hemisphere in some places, and in, including in South Georgia Island, they, prior to us going, they had closed part of South Georgia Island. And they ultimately ended up closing Sea Lion Island a month after we left because it had gotten in there. 
Uh, and in fact, in all the locations we went, when you came in and out of the buildings, they had these little foot baths that had like this solution in it. And you had to put your, your feet and your boots in it as you came and, and, and went. Uh, and it wasn't so much they were worried about um, what, what, you were, what you were bringing there. Like you, you were fine. They just didn't know like what was else there and might be tracked to other areas and to other islands and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's and it's also hit along the coast of South America, as I understand it. Some of these seal populations, I mean, like hundreds of them, if not more, just huge die-offs. Um, it's a real concern, a real concern. And the, the thing with these these colonial nesting species, right, is that that's the problem. Like it only takes one. Once it get, it just like spreads like wildfire. You know, with you know snipe. Like they're not, you know, that's not an issue, right? They're not, they're not getting in these big groups, but with these colonial nesting birds, that's because we're a real problem. And they were worried about with albatross as well, I believe. Yes, I think he wants to scoop me out of here. So, but just fine. <laughs> I got a long drive back to the Boston area. Yes, real quick. How many photographs did you take? So in my defense, I was taking photos and video, although most of it was photos. There was one day alone, I'll use the word files because it includes photos and videos. There were 8,500 files on one day alone, which was which was the last location because we only had one full day of photography there. So I was like, I got to make the most of it. So I was just constantly doing something, right? So yeah, one day alone, 8,500 files. That's a lot. Electricity off the other oh yeah, 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 yep. Every place you went had power. Yep. Again, thanks, folks. And by the way, so if anyone's interested, I have a little bit of information that you can look at here before you leave, including the field guide. And if anybody wants to have my business card, you can take that, go to my website, my YouTube channel, <coughs> Instagram, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me and then I'll see you in June and you can ask me questions that you didn't ask me now. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. I'm going to leave here, yes.